Much like any startup, the NPS, the national pension system has gone through many tweaks and changes over the past few years. I remember there was a time when at least 60% of the corpus had to be allocated to an annuity, which has since been brought down to 40%. The entry age has been revised twice from 60 to 65 and then from 65 to 70 years. NPS itself was first introduced for government employees, which was later extended to all citizens of India. A majority of the work is now being done online. New pension fund managers have been regularly added, etc, etc. Now, I've covered many of these changes in a previous video, but the pace of change is so frantic that I had no choice but to make this updated video, which is truly a compilation of new rules and regulations over the last two years. If you're already an NPS subscriber or are looking to enroll into one, and now that the tax season is looming, then I'm sure you'll find this video extremely useful. I should also mention that this was not an easy thing to compile. And because NPS is not my strong suit, I'll request you to do your own research on top of this. And to help out, I've added a nice long list of resources and links in the video's description. Let's begin. All right, so let's start with something that I got wrong in my previous video. Actually, I got a couple of things wrong. Firstly, an OCI, an overseas citizen of India, can invest in NPS. I think I said he or she cannot invest, which was wrong. So sorry about that. And secondly, what I had said and what I had thought is that a subscriber can choose only one pension fund manager across assets, which also turned out to be wrong because since last year, NPS subscribers can choose different fund managers for different asset classes. If you're an NPS subscriber, I do hope you're taking advantage of this because A, you can now pick and choose the more consistent above average performers across assets. And secondly, unlike mutual funds, there are no tax implications of switching from one scheme to the other across pension managers or asset classes. If you're wondering which are the better ones, then here's something I borrowed from a study done by ET Money. So with regards to class E, that is equities, the schemes of HDFC, ICICI and Kotak have done well. LIC, HDFC and Aditya Birla are the top three when it comes to government securities. And HDFC, Aditya Birla and SBI have the best returns when it comes to corporate bonds. So if you are an NPS subscriber or are wanting to become one, then use this data, use this flexibility to improve the returns of your long term NPS portfolio. Okay, so until now, NPS subscribers upon retiring were allowed to withdraw up to 60% of their accumulated funds in a tax-free lump sum mode, while the balance 40% was to be allocated to an annuity instrument. While there are no changes to the 40% part, subscribers can now choose to withdraw the 60% part either as lump sum or on a periodic basis once they reach 60 years of age. Formally, this is called systematic lump sum withdrawal or SLW and one can choose to receive his or her retirement payments in a monthly, quarterly, half yearly or annual mode until the age of 75. So this is a lot similar to what mutual funds offer in terms of a systematic withdrawal plan with one major difference that is no tax needs to be paid on SLW receipts or at least that's my understanding because according to section 1012A of the Income Tax Act, lump sum withdrawal from NPS of up to 60% are exempt from taxes and ideally the same rule should be applied in this case also. Of course, I'm not a tax expert, so please consult your tax advisor on this. And don't forget to read this FAQ document, which explains some of the finer points, like how can a subscriber activate the SLW facility? When will the first installment be paid out? Can SLW be modified or canceled in the future? What happens if the subscriber expires and stuff like that? My point is this SLW facility is a big relief for NPS subscribers as most of them would have little idea of what to do with that huge 60% lump sum. And now they can withdraw a little bit every month for their expenses. They don't have to pay taxes on it. And the corpus continues to grow within the NPS environment. Another rule the PFRDA has recently introduced, I think in October of last year, is a mandatory penny drop verification. So a penny drop is an account verification method that involves depositing a small amount, let's say one rupee or two rupees, in the subscriber's bank account for authentication before creating funds to the beneficiary. So essentially issues like name mismatch, invalid or inactive account number, wrong IFSC code, etc. are taken care of through this verification and funds get credited to the beneficiary without any delays. Since this is mandatory now, that is you can't withdraw any funds before this authentication 
information. I'll request all subscribers to complete this penny drop exercise as soon as possible. And if you face any issues that do involve the relevant nodal office or your intermediary to rectify the same. Also, please note this penny drop thing applies not just to NPS, but to also the Atal Pension Yojana and NPS Lite, and also in case there are any modifications in the subscriber's bank account details. Another pleasant update and something that subscribers like you and me would appreciate is the unified view of our personal investments, which not only includes our DMAT account and mutual fund holdings, but also the updated mark-to-market value of one's NPS accounts. In that context, the PFRD issued a circular on the 10th of August last year allowing central record-keeping agencies, so CAMS, KFintech, and Protein, to integrate the NPS statement of transaction with the more popular Consolidated Account Statement, or CAS, that's offered by SEBI registered depositories. But please note this feature is consent-based, which means the NPS subscriber has to enable this feature by registering on the CAMS, KFintech, or Protein website. When doing that, keep a few things handy, like your PRAN, that is the permanent retirement account number, an OTP, the date of birth, a couple more details, and if everything matches, then the NPS account will be included in the CAS and will start appearing in it from the following month onwards. Incidentally, this feature is not free and there is a very nominal charge of 1 rupee for a physical statement request and 10 pesa for an email statement. Speaking of emails and consolidation, one place to find some interesting investing-worthy ideas is my newsletter that is now read by over 16,000 investors. Some of the featured stories include the TCS buyback opportunity and how one can make 18% profit in a single month, which developers stand to benefit from Ahmedabad's 2036 Olympic bid, why the stock price of BSE Limited surged by almost 300% in just six months, why the promoters of JTL Industries are buying shares at higher than its market price, the 12% yield that infrastructure investment trusts are offering, and many more. The stories featured here are some of my high conviction ones, so if you haven't subscribed to it, then kindly do so and also share it in your WhatsApp groups. In October of 2022, the PFRD announced some changes with respect to the equity exposure on NPS accounts. So prior to October, under the active choice option, NPS subscribers could allocate up to 75% of their funds to equity in a tier 1 account. However, on crossing the age of 51, the allocation limit is gradually reduced by 2.5% every year, which means it becomes 72.5%, then 70% at the age of 52, and by the time the subscriber is 60 years old, this limit comes down to 50%. The change that PFRD affected is that active choice subscribers can now continue to allocate up to 75% of their funds in equity, even after crossing 51 years of age without any gradual reduction until the age of 60 which means tier 1 NPS account holders can go up to 75% in equity up to 60 years. And if you have a tier 2 account, then one can allocate up to 100% in equity, while the earlier limit was 75%. In May of 2023, the PFRD released a circular that said, the option of multiple annuities shall be provided for those subscribers who earmark an annuity corpus of more than 10 lakh rupees, wherein 5 lakhs is utilized to buy each annuity scheme. So this option of multiple annuities wasn't there earlier, but now that the PFRD has allowed it, it means an NPS subscriber can diversify across a broad range of annuity options and it also gives more flexibility as one can choose different payout options like a monthly mode from one scheme and an annual mode from the other in line with the subscriber's cash requirements. The article I read to this effect also indicated that the CRAs, that is CAMS, Protein, and KFintech, will need more time to build these functionalities. And until then, the life insurers will handle these requests for multiple annuities and feed it back to the CRAs via a reverse information flow. So this is again a small tweak by the NPS regulator, but something that can help the subscribers at large. Alright, so effective the 1st of April 2023, the PFRD has mandated the upload of certain documents in order to speed up and simplify a subscriber's annuity payments after he or she exits the national pension system. This communication came in February of last year, and the list of documents includes the NPS exit or withdrawal form, a proof of identity, a proof of address as per what's specified in the withdrawal form, a copy of the bank account, and also a copy of the PRAN card. 
Relatively, it was in 2022 that the PFRD had announced that NPS subscribers would not be required to complete a separate proposal form for selecting an annuity and the exit form submitted by the subscriber would double up as an annuity proposal form. As one can understand, less paperwork definitely reduces the time it takes for a life insurance company to issue an annuity policy leading to better service experience for the subscriber. Yet another improvement that helps subscribers is the reduction in settlement time, which means faster withdrawals. In that context, the PFRD announced in August of 2022 that the NPS intermediaries, that is the three CRAs, the 12 pension funds and the custodians have all enhanced their IT capabilities and their improved system was capable of processing a withdrawal request in a T plus two working day settlement cycle, which was earlier done on a T plus four basis. Which means now if a withdrawal request is authorized by 11 a.m., then it will be settled on a T plus two working day basis, which is definitely a better customer experience for the NPS subscriber. In terms of withdrawal requests, this covers the entire range or most of it, including superannuation, premature exit, exit due to death, annuity withdrawals, tier two withdrawals, partial withdrawals, one way switches, rebalancing and much more. Okay, this should not surprise anyone, but the Unified Payment Interface or UPI has made inroads into NPS, albeit in a phased format. Now, before UPI was introduced, all NPS contributions were done using net banking, that is via IMPS, NEFT and RTGS. Then in 2020, UPI entered the fray and payments of up to 2000 rupees were allowed in a single transaction. Then in 2022, the PFRD made some improvements in the process and subscribers could use this complicated looking UPI handle to make contributions. Understandably, this wasn't very convenient and with the virtual account number being different from the PRAN and different numbers required for tier 1 and tier 2 accounts, it was very evident that a simpler and more efficient method was needed. And so in December of last year, the regulator enabled contributions via a QR code, which essentially meant any investor could now quickly generate their personalized QR code for the tier one and tier two accounts, and then use any UPI enabled app to contribute by scanning these QR codes. Understandably, this improved process is not only faster and easier, but also reduces any errors or mistakes that might have happened along the way. Right, so what I've compiled so far is all the goody goody stuff, but something that I'm sure would have definitely irked many NPS subscribers is PFRD's removal of credit cards as a contribution paying instrument. This new rule came into effect from August of 2022, but pleasantly this is only applicable to tier two accounts where contributions cannot be made via credit cards now, while subscribers can continue to use their credit cards for making their tier one contributions. Personally, I think this move is in line with what's happening elsewhere, that is the use of credit cards for investing in mutual funds or stocks is anyway discouraged. So this is no different and because a tier two account is a lot like a mutual fund, this rule change was just a matter of time. So as one can see here, the regulators and intermediaries have been doing a lot of stuff and from what I've read and heard, there is a lot more coming, especially around the products, the user interface, reduction in charges, quicker turnaround, better customer service, the greater adoption of NPS as a retirement tool and much more. I'm sure there will be another update from my end a few months from now. But if you like this video, then do give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends and I'll see you next week. Until then.